Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Amen. That had a dramatic closing, didn't it? Um, let's pray. Lord Jesus, we lift up this message, I lift up this worship, and I pray that it is acceptable and pleasing in your sight, O oh Lord. God, we are so grateful for the week that we've just had, for the week that's to come. Lord, I just pray that, that we all have just a spirit of thankfulness and gratitude. I know I do. We've seen you show up again and again and again. Lord, I give you this time, I give you this message, and I pray that you guide my words. But more than anything, I pray, Lord, that your Holy Spirit will, will make it so that each person here will walk away with what you want them to know, Lord. We pray all of this in the mighty, powerful name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. So, Americans, um, in general, tend to be pretty fixated on happiness, right? Um, so if you watch some commercials, it's all about being happy. It's all about being happy in what we eat. It's, it's in being happy in what we drink, being happy in where we go on vacation, being happy in the kind of toilet paper we buy. We are so fixated on happiness. And so much of our branding and marketing is all about this. This item will make you happier. Um, we relentlessly seek happiness. The pursuit of happiness is built into our founding documents. Our most popu popular amusement park is called what? The happiest place on earth, right? And people flock there and pay all kinds of money and deal with all kinds of crowds to just get a piece of that. Self-care, this, this quest to make, become happier and more satisfied, is now a multi-trillion dollar industry in this country. And yet, I read an article this week that we have never been more miserable. We have never been more miserable as a society. A recent Gallup poll, and this was in the last few months, it found that only one-third of Americans report being satisfied with their lives. It's an all-time low. The National Institute for Mental Health estimates that in the past year, 21 million adults in the United States had at least one major depressive episode. And both depressive and anxiety disorders have increased dramatically. Um, before the pandemic, at any given time, um, most clinicians would say that about 10% of our population met the criteria for either an anxiety or a depressive disorder. During the pandemic, that went up to 30%, and we haven't really seen it decline that significantly. In fact, um, even though we've kind of gotten back to normal in our life activities, our overall sense of dissatisfaction, not just anxiety and depression, but general feelings of ha unhappiness are continuing. And I, I think this touches every single one of us in this room. It touches all of us. Maybe you're there. You're like, yes, that's me or a loved one, or a friend, someone you know is battling these kinds of feelings. As we head into Thanksgiving week, 
we're going to be around relatives and friends and acquaintances, maybe people that we haven't seen in a while. And some of them will be dealing with this kind of stuff, right? General feelings of unhappiness, perpetual complainers, highly negative, miserable and just plain hard to be around. Is that just my family or is it yours too? <laughs> <laughs> That's the reality. Um, if, you, if you're on social media, oh, social media, either love it or hate it, right? So I was looking at my Facebook feed and there's some people who just seem to be totally and completely unhappy. It's like tragic even. And so I've reflected on this a lot recently. I can't help but think this says something about who we are as a society that there are fundamental things missing from our lives. And certainly that, that goes for many unbelievers, but it goes for some believers as well. Or maybe a better way to frame this is that we're looking at happiness in totally the wrong way. So what does this have to do with the book of Philippians? Over um, the last four weeks, we've been walking through Paul's letter to the church at Philippi, and we've been talking a lot about gratitude and being thankful. Today, we're looking at Philippians chapter 4, and this is probably one of my favorite chapters in the whole Bible. I think I, I, I say that about a lot of scripture, but really, this is one of my favorite chapters. Why? Because in the midst of living in a society that strives so hard to be happy and fails, Paul shares with us the keys to true joy. So today we are just going to focus on verses 4 through 8. We heard them read in the video. But I would encourage you when you go home today to read through all of chapter 4. It's not that long. Because it is just such a beautiful end to Paul's letter to the brothers and sisters of, in the church in Philippi, these people he loves so, so much. So be sure to read through all of chapter 4. Because we're going to start with verse 4. And this is a very familiar verse to all of us. Pastor Roberto has already um, quoted it several times today. Paul says this, Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Say that out loud. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Have joy in God. Be joyful in the Lord always always. And what's interesting to me about this letter, it's four very short chapters. And in those four short chapters, Paul uses the some form of the word rejoice or joy or be joyful, some form of that, at least 14 times. And the reason I say at least 14 times is something I read said 14, another thing said 16. I didn't go through and count them. You can if you'd like. You can let me know. But regardless, Paul is very serious about joy. He is very, very serious about joy. And he's not at some, you know, swanky resort somewhere drinking fine wine and eating steak. He's sitting in a Roman prison cell. I know we've mentioned this um, over the last few weeks, but I want to, I really want to focus on this. Paul is sitting in a Roman prison cell writing this letter, and he's saying, rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. So I totally got off on a tangent this week in writing my message and did all this research on Roman prisons in the first century in Palestine. And surprisingly, there is a lot of information out, out there. Um, what would this have been like for Paul? Roman prison cells were designed to strip a prisoner of dignity. So they were dark, they were dank, they were filthy, they had poor ventilation, which generally means they smelled really bad. And um, 
they were often overcrowded. So unlike today, there was no such thing as being condemned to serve a sentence in prison. Although people would spend quite a bit of time in prison, their time there was just a waiting game. They were awaiting trial to be given their real punishment, which could very well be death. So Paul, at the time that he is writing this letter, this was one of his last letters, if not his very last, he's probably been in prison for about four years. He has no idea what's going to become of him. He has no idea what's going to happen. Now, we know from reading the book of Acts that he has been charged with inciting riots among the Jews. So inciting riots among the Jewish communities. And he is simply in prison waiting to hear whether or not he would be put to death. And he says... Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Rejoice in the Lord always. So um, I did this thing. I looked up the word always in ancient Greek. And you know what it means? Always. <laughs> All the time. Always. So when are we to rejoice in God? Well, always. You I mean, we don't just rejoice when things are re going really well and we're feeling really good and our marriage is happy and our bank account is full and we're on vacation and the kids are well behaved. No. We rejoice, what? Always. That's right. It's when things aren't going well. It's when we don't feel very good. It's when our marriage is on the brink of collapse and our bank account is empty. It's when you're stuck in traffic on State Route 60 and you're not sure you're ever going to be able to get home. It's when your kids are, and your grandkids are really struggling. It's even when you're sitting in a Roman prison cell. Rejoice, rejoice, rejoice. And that, my friends, makes no sense. It makes no sense according to the world. What makes sense to the world? Happiness, right? Seeking happiness, we already talked about that. Happiness is based on your happenings. And when your happenings, your circumstances are going really well, when you feel really good and things are going your way and you're engaging in pleasurable things, then you are happy. But joy is something else entirely. And in the English language, I think we, we too often, we interchange those words, happiness and joy. They are not the same. Our world doesn't really understand joy. Because joy is not a feeling, joy is not an emotion, joy is not positive thinking, joy is not self-help, joy is not dependent on our circumstances or whether things are going our way. Joy is a fruit of the Holy Spirit. Joy is the manifestation of God in the midst of any circumstance, any circumstance. It's an orientation that all of life is a gift. Every single day is a gift from God. That's joy. And joy isn't really of this world. Joy is a supernatural thing. An inner contentment of the soul that is actively responding to Jesus Christ. It's an inner conviction that while things are not right, everything will be all right. It's not of this world. And that's why the world doesn't understand it. To rejoice always means to declare the presence of God in your circumstances, no matter how hard or painful they may be. I'm going to, you can see that on the screen. I'm going to repeat that. To rejoice always, as Paul is telling us, 
means to declare the presence of God in your circumstances, no matter how hard or painful they may be. And this is so hard. It's even hard to say this, to get these words out of my mouth. But what that means is that there is no circumstance that eludes joy. That includes death. That includes financial crisis. That includes physical illness. It includes mental illness. It includes broken relationships. Rejoicing in God in these situations means that we declare, we proclaim that God is there with us. We are not alone. And it doesn't mean, I want to be very clear here, it doesn't mean we're going to be free from pain or grief. Those are human emotions. And all of us in here, I believe, are humans. So you're going to experience human emotions. What it means is that there can be a sense of joy, there can be a sense of peace, simply because the presence of the living God is there. This is hard stuff. But Paul says, rejoice in the Lord always. Verses 5 through 7, he continues. He says, let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about what? Anything. But in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Jesus Christ. So oftentimes, when, when something really bad happens, our go-to human reaction is anxiety. At least it is for me. Um, even if something is just like kind of bad, not even like a huge tragedy, just even something a little annoying, and, and oftentimes our go-to reaction is anxiety. I think about, you know, all you guys know that I have a 19-year-old daughter who's at Auburn University, and she calls me with her crisis of the day, and it becomes my crisis of the day, and my, yes, my go-to reaction too often is anxiety. Oh no, she's, she's failed that test. Oh my gosh. Oh, is she safe? Did she make it back to her apartment safely? And so my reaction is anxiety. Um, and the thing about anxiety is, and I've, I've shared in here about how I've struggled with anxiety. The thing about anxiety is that your brain automatically goes to the worst case scenario. Does anybody relate? You know, so yeah, like it's not logical. It doesn't make sense, but you automatically assume the very worst is going to happen. Oh, so Rosie didn't call me and she said she was going to call me. So that must mean that she got in a car accident or she's in a ditch somewhere or she was kidnapped. And I will stay up all night long thinking about that. You jump to the worst case scenario. And of course, the root of anxiety is fear, right? That's the root of anxiety. We're so fearful that something bad is going to happen. So I read this several years ago. This is um, when the pandemic had just started. Uh, J.D. Walt, who writes the, the daily text for, for Seedbed, he was walking through the book of Philippians, and he, he wrote these two statements, and I kind of adjusted them, made them more my own, but um, they've stayed with me for over two years now. So they're on the screen. He said, the remedy for anxiety is peace. So I want you to really think about that. The remedy for anxiety is peace, and the way to peace is gentleness. The way to peace is gentleness. So what does that mean? 
you know, start with this idea of gentleness. Because So Paul says, let your gentleness be evident to all, for the Lord is near. So gentleness, that sounds kind of odd, right? You know, I immediately, when I think of gentleness, I think of what we say to our, our kids. Um, we say, be gentle, use gentle touch which basically means don't hit that other person or don't stick your finger in the dog's eye. You know, be gentle. And, and really, the meaning of gentleness isn't too far off from that. Um, gentleness means not causing harm, being gracious, being humble, being meek, not looking out for your own needs, but, but really just for the needs of others, seeking <clears throat> to be like Jesus. Gentleness is seeking to be like Jesus. Gentleness is the temperament of someone who knows that the Lord is near. So if someone knows that the Lord is near, they're not going to lash out in anger. If someone knows, just knows consciously that the Lord is near, they're not going to <clears throat> be rough, be violent. Gentleness is the temperament of someone who knows that the Lord is near. So when something really horrible happens, when we're in the midst of despair, but we know that the Lord is near, then it creates space in our lives to have a different reaction than anxiety. And this is hard. I'll, I'll be honest. This is really hard for me. <clears throat> Rather than constant worry and anxious thoughts, we can move to prayer and petition. This is basically what Paul is saying. He's, let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. When you know the Lord is near, then you don't have to be anxious about anything. Because in every situation, by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, you present your request to God. So, Rather than constant worry, I want you to hear these words, rather than constant worry and anxiety, it creates space in our life to know that we go to the Lord in prayer and petition, because we know that the Lord is near. So when we're gentle and we know that God is near, we seek God in prayer. Does this make sense? It's not really a formula, but it is kind of a pattern, right? So Paul is giving us a pattern here. And I think that, that it's really helpful. So you'll see this on the screen, Paul's pattern. First, you choose to rejoice, right? That's a decision we make. To rejoice when? Always. That's right. So we make this decision to rejoice. And when we rejoice, it, we're, we, we know that God is near. We are gentle, right? We are gentle people, and we know that the Lord is near. We know God is near. And when we know God is near, then our go-to reaction is not anxiety. It's actually prayer, prayer and petition, seeking God in prayer. And what I want to say about seeking God in prayer is um, when we seek God in prayer, we're rejoicing in who God is. We're thanking God for what he has done. Um, we're presenting our requests to God. There is something really powerful when, when you pray to God to say the words out loud, right? To say them out loud. And oftentimes we think our prayers, and I do that too. Like, we're not always in places where we can speak our prayers out loud. I mean, we can, but people think we're crazy. But I would encourage you, I would challenge you that when you seek, when you go to God in prayer as much as possible to speak those words out loud, because it's a reminder that God is real and God is listening. The prayer is not, this prayer that you're saying is not just a mental exercise, but you are speaking to your Lord and Savior who loves you and adores you. There's something really powerful about saying those words out loud. So, choose to rejoice, be gentle, know that God is near, seek God in prayer. And what does that yield? It yields, number one, less anxiety. 
less anxiety because we're yielding control to God. It's not all about us being able to fix it. We're yielding control to God. We're giving it to God. It also yields more thanksgiving. There's a reason why the scripture specifically says to present your request to God with thanksgiving. Because gratitude does something to our heart. Gratitude does something to our heart. When we are thankful, we are reminded of God's faithfulness. The bells just played, great is thy faithfulness. God is a faithful God. And we, sometimes we just need to be reminded of how faithful God is, of the times he has shown up over and over again and just taken care of us. Take a moment to think about your life. Think about being thankful for the times that God has been faithful. Maybe, maybe it was um, a situation where your marriage was falling apart and God's hand was at work and you saw reconciliation. Or maybe it was something with your, a child or a grandchild, an illness, a difficult situation, whatever it was, you know what it is, that you just you saw God faithful in the midst of that. Or maybe it was um, something with your finances and you just saw God's hand at work, faithful. We need to be reminded of that. I, I think about, there have been so many times where God has shown up and taken care of me, my children, my um, marriage, this church, the vote we had on Monday night. Let me tell you how many the ways God showed up over the last six months and took care of me and took care of us. The words of affirmation and the prayers and just amazing. More thanksgiving. Gratitude. It does something to our heart. It reminds us that God has shown up over and over again and taken care of us. So less anxiety, more thanksgiving. And then the other yield is peace. Peace, not, not peace meaning a lack of conflict, a lack of war. Peace meaning shalom, wholeness, restoration. Isn't that what we all desire? Just wholeness and restoration. So that is Paul's pattern. And I think it's a really, really powerful one if we make use of it. I recently read that there are two kinds of people. There are those who are currently facing really hard circumstances. And there are those that will soon be facing really hard circumstances. John 16, the words of Jesus, he says, in this world, you will have trouble. In this world, you will have trouble. But take heart. I have overcome the world. So this is the reality. When, not if, when we face trouble, when we face hardship, when we face difficult circumstances, we have two choices. We can choose anxiety or we can choose rejoicing. Those are our choices. Anxiety is generally how the world responds. That's why we're so dang unhappy. Because we choose anxiety. It's the world's go-to response. It leads to more distress. It leads to more seeking escape and things like food and alcohol and drugs and sex and shopping and anything else that will bring pleasure, even if it's just for a moment. Anything that makes us happier, even if it's just for a little while. And God is calling us to respond differently by rejoicing. 
Rejoicing reminds us of who God is and who we are. It rejoices, it remind, rejoicing reminds us that we are not alone. We are never, ever, 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 ever alone. Rejoicing leads to peace. Anxiety leads to inner conflict and misery, and I know that. I have lived that. Inner conflict and misery. And yet, and rejoicing leads to peace. The last verse um, that we're going to look at today is verse 8. And it says this, Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. I would encourage you to memorize this verse. Memorize this verse. This is about changing our thought life. And it's a method or strategy, if you will, for dealing with worry and anxiety. So often we get like in this loop of worries, of the bad things, or just, it's like a tape we play in our head over and over and over and over again. Well, what if this happens? Well, what, why did that happen? Well, what will I do if this happens? It's this tape. And we have a hard time stopping the loop. And I'm wondering if Paul, in his Roman prison cell, sometimes fell prey to this kind of thinking. He was a human being, so my guess is he did. And it's like he's telling us, look, you, you think you can't rejoice, but you can. You think you can't rejoice in your circumstance, but I am saying, yes, you can. Stop thinking about all the really bad stuff. And start thinking about that which is true, which is noble, which is right, which is pure, which is lovely, which is admirable, which is excellent, which is worthy of praise. Friends, this means turning off the news. It means turning off the news. If you leave your news station on all the time, I promise you, you will ruminate on the bad stuff. There is, it's absolutely impossible to not do so. Now, we need to know what's going on in our world, but we don't need to constantly have that negativity just like filling us. It affects you. It affects you. You might not think it affects you, but I'm telling you, it does affect you. It means turning off Facebook. A little bit of Facebook sometimes can be okay. You gotta know when to close the laptop. Gotta know when to take a break. It means removing the external sources of negativity from your life as much as you can. Focus on that which is worthy of praise. Focus on that which is worthy of what? Praise. So what things in your life are worthy of praise? I'm looking around and I know all of you have things in your life that are worthy of praise. Like I think about, I have so many things in my life that are worthy of praise. I have this congregation. You are worthy of praise. You bring me joy. I think about this church. I think about my family. I think about my children. I think about my dogs. They're worthy of praise. Think about, I have dear friends. It's, they're worthy of praise. I, I think about the fact we live in Florida and I can be outside so much. That's worthy of praise. I was sitting on my sofa last night and the doors were open and, and I was hearing the wind chimes. And I was thinking, that's worthy of praise. It brings me joy. There are so many things that are, are worthy of praise. Why do we focus on the negative. So when you get stuck in a negative thought loop, using this verse is an exercise into, in turning anxiety into joy. And I know this because when I was at my deepest, one of, one of the, the, the times of my life where I was dealing with anxiety probably in the most severe way, this verse saved me. I mean, God saved me. But this verse made all the difference. 
because I would be driving in my car and I would feel overcome with a sense of panic and, and I'd be like, focus on that, which is excellent and praiseworthy. Focus on that, which is admirable and pure. And I would just go through in my head and start thinking about all the things that are wor worthy of praise and those negative thoughts. God takes them away from you. It's, a, it's amazing. It's a miracle. This is God's word and it's living and it's breathing. So what if for this Thanksgiving week, what if we did, you did something a little different? You made a commitment to focus on two things. First, choosing rejoicing over anxiety. So you're going to make a conscious decision to choose rejoicing over anxiety. And the second one would be choosing to focus on things that are worthy of praise. Now, these are words that are very easy to say, and it's a lot harder to live out. I know that. But think about what your week would be like if you committed to those two things. How might your Thanksgiving week be different? Friends, Jesus came to give us life and to give it to us abundantly. Say the word abundantly. Abundantly. He didn't want us to just simply exist. He wanted us to, to thrive, to have joy, to rejoice in, in how many circumstances? All. Rejoice always. To experience shalom. To bring him glory. Don't settle for less. Don't settle for less. No matter what you are dealing with, no matter what you are going through, God is with you. I want you to hear those words. God is with you. As believers in Jesus, we are tasked with demonstrating to the world, this very unhappy world, we are tasked in demonstrating that there is a different way of doing life in which you can experience joy and you can experience hope and you can experience peace even in the darkest times. We are to be light in the darkness because God has called us out of darkness into his marvelous, beautiful light. Amen? We are broken, and this world is filled with trouble, but we belong to the one who overcame it all. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we rejoice in you. We rejoice in you. Lord, I, just, I pray for all of these good people here, and I pray, Lord, that, that we can commit to choosing rejoicing, that we can commit to joy over anxiety, we can commit to focusing on things that are worthy of your praise, that we can truly be light in the darkness. We love you, Lord, and we thank you because we have the assurance that no matter what we are dealing with, you are always with us. You are always with us, and that makes all the difference. Amen.